This podcast may contain content that is graphic and disturbing in nature. Listener discretion is advised. After a terrifying assault, this woman was determined to put her attacker behind bars. She was certain she had identified the right man. However, after 10 years, new evidence submitted would reveal a new victim. How did the survivor turn pain into purpose? This is episode 49, The Jennifer Thompson Story. Hi, Megan. Hi, Amy. How are you today? I'm great. What's going on with you? Oh, nothing. I'm excited for today's case, as usual. As usual. Yep. I want to thank Emma and Natalie Bellino for their help with today's research. Oh, excellent. Thanks, girls. Yes, thank you. Megan, today's case inspired my master's thesis. Oh, yes. Do you remember what I wrote my thesis on? Um, it's... <laughs> I do. It's yes. going to be, it's wrongful conviction. It would be eyewitness identification. Oh, you really do listen. Yes. Do you know what I wrote my thesis on? I know your dissertation was bail. Yes. All right. Okay. All right. You paid attention to me too. <laughs> so Megan, before we jump into today's episode, let's thank some of our supporters. Sounds great. Hey, okay, so first we have Megan M. Hey, like your name. Isn't thanks, that a Megan. V- very cool name. And we also have Kelly from Austin. Oh, thanks, Kelly. We might be in Austin this year. Oh my gosh, Crime Con. Yes. Oh, fingers crossed. Yes, we'll be virtual, hopefully, if not in person. So yes. stay tuned for that. And Kelly, hopefully we'll see you there. And Megan, I want to quickly read a message that somebody left us on Instagram. Oh, okay. We love hearing from you all. We love your emails. We love when you write us on Facebook, on Instagram, on Reddit. We just really love hearing from you. So this person with such a cute dog as their profile picture says that we are both an inspiration to the true crime world and for the criminal justice system. And as a woman pursuing a degree in this field, I am thrilled to have found two intelligent, knowledgeable people who handle each case with integrity, in-depth thought, and respect. Thank you for being a source of positive energy to my life and a reminder of why my own path has been led to this field. Wow. Yeah, it's one of the nicer things I've read ever. Honestly, that's so nice. I've gotten a couple of people who are in this field who have felt some inspiration and have reached out to us to ask us questions and... We're always happy to, you know, help advise. And we're, I think it's so great to inspire people to go in this field because we're so passionate about it. Yep. Yeah. Thank you all so much for your support in any way, whether it's social media, leaving a review, telling a friend, becoming a patron, whatever it is, we really appreciate you. Thank you, everyone. So this case inspired my thesis and my interest in wrongful convictions, but specifically in the area of eyewitness identification issues. So let's talk a little bit about the background here. In 1984, Jennifer Thompson was a 22-year-old college student with a 4.0 attending Elon College in Burlington, North Carolina. It was her senior year, and her goal was to graduate as valedictorian of her class, and she was looking forward to a teaching assistant position where she planned on getting her master's degree in exercise physiology. She was a really smart girl. She was working two jobs. During the day, she was teaching a woman's health and aerobics class. And in the evening, she worked at a restaurant. She also had a serious boyfriend who was attending a nearby university. And the two were talking about getting engaged. Things were going well for this young woman. And Megan, I'm not spending too much time on her background here because there is a lot to cover in this case. A lot has happened um, since the crime as well. Okay. July 28th, 1984 was a typical day for Jennifer. She was attending classes and studying for final exams. She had gone to play tennis with her boyfriend, and then afterwards, they went out to eat at a restaurant. Around 9 o'clock, Jennifer came down with a pretty bad headache, so her boyfriend took her home, and he took care of her until around 11 p.m. when she fell asleep. According to Jennifer, around 3 a.m., she was awoken by a noise in her room. She says she then felt a brush against her left arm, and she quickly looked to the left, and she saw someone's head down beside her mattress. Our biggest fear, right? I was going to say, every woman's worst nightmare. Yep. She immediately asked who was there, and that is when a man jumped on top of her, pinned down her arms, pinned down her legs, and told her to shut up or he would kill her. And he held a knife to her neck and covered her mouth with a gloved hand. Terrifying. She did what anyone would do. She told the man, take whatever you want. She told him where her money was, because she was thinking and hoping that he had broken in her home to rob her. 
The man told her he didn't want her money, and she says that is when she knew what was about to happen. This is when she knew he was going to rape her, but at this point, she says she just wasn't sure if he was going to kill her as well. Right. Despite what was happening, though, Jennifer stayed very calm and says she tried to remember every single detail about the man's face, about the man's body, what he was wearing, what he sounded like, because she says she wanted to be able to identify him if she survived this brutal attack. And as painful as it was, she made sure to keep her eyes open pretty much the whole time during this awful assault on her. And as she says in her New York Times op-ed, quote, when and if I survived the attack, I was going to make sure that he was put in prison and he was going to rot. That's some wherewithal. I agree. She was very smart and very level-headed. I'm not sure I would have been able to do that. She was also sure not to fight back or scream. Jennifer says the man had definitely been drinking because she could smell it on him. She also discovered that he had been in her house for many hours before he raped her. Because he had gone through her wallet, he took her money, he drank her beer, he went through her cabinets, and it turns out she slept through all this, and not only did she sleep through this man in her apartment, we'll find out later that she slept through lots of sirens because police were in the area looking for a burglary suspect who had, turns out, been hiding in her apartment the whole time. Oh my God. So by the time the assault occurred, he knew her name, he knew where she was from, he knew that she wore glasses, Although it turns out she needed them to see far, so she was able to see him probably clearer than he believed she could. He had also referred to her boyfriend being in Germany, which in fact was her brother who had sent her postcards, but clearly he went through her personal items to have even known this. After the attack, the perpetrator told Jennifer that he needed her to calm down, and she told him that she was very much afraid of knives and asked if he could please put the knife outside. Wow. Yeah, so she was trying to find a way to obviously get him out of the bedroom. How can I escape this situation? He actually did listen, and he put the knife right outside the door, but not there wasn't enough time that she could escape. She also asked at this point if she could use the bathroom, and he allowed her to do so, but made her turn off the light. When she was in the bathroom, she was looking around to see, what can I do? Well, fortunately, there was a window. Unfortunately, that window was much too small for Jennifer to escape. She then asked if she could get a drink, and she also offered him a drink. Again, this is very smart. She's able to stay calm and just kind of play his game. She went into the kitchen and she was making lots of noise. He was in her living room. He turned on the stereo, made some comment about being ready to party. He thought that this was going to be a good time. At the same time, Jennifer is plotting her escape. She Mm -hmm. knows there is a door in her kitchen. So remember I said she's making lots of noise, hoping to kind of have him not notice what's about to happen. She also knew that if she turned on the lights, he wouldn't go near her because he made sure to stay away from any light because he was trying to protect himself from being identified. So she made sure to turn on that kitchen light as well. At this point, she musters up the courage to run. She opens up her kitchen door and runs as fast as she could. And at this point, she's wearing only a sheet around her. Wow. Her attacker runs right after her. She first went to a neighbor, but the neighbor was not home. So Jennifer says she was looking for a place with light because she believed that he would not follow her if it was a brightly lit area. Again, very smart of her to do. Thank God he did not get her. So she sees this house that has a carport with a bright light. She runs and bangs on the door. Turns out the woman who lived there was a professor that worked at the college where Jennifer attended school, and she very quickly recognized Jennifer and let her in. Oh, thank God. At this point, they called 911 for her, and the perpetrator seemingly vanishes into thin air. Wow. Yes. Jennifer pretty much blacks out in the sense that she doesn't really remember much. She even says how she, at some point, she realized she's wearing clothes. It turns out that this couple had given her clothes. They had a teenage daughter and given Jennifer some clothes because she was wearing just a sheet. And she just uses this as an example to say that she was like in another world. She didn't even remember this happening. I imagine shock kicked in. I would think so, especially when she realized she was finally safe. Mm -hmm. Like she didn't have to be in that fight mode anymore. And then she probably like disassociated even. Yeah. Jennifer was taken to the hospital where they performed a rape kit. At this point, they collected semen, pubic hair, saliva, nail clippings. They're getting all the evidence that they can. And while she was there, she heard another woman screaming and sobbing and soon discovered that this other woman had been raped very likely by the same man. Same description about a mile away from where Jennifer stayed. In the same night? Same night. It was not long after she was brought into the hospital. Unfortunately, this other woman, although she did survive, thankfully, she got beaten up pretty bad. If it was the same perpetrator, that's rare to commit two sexual assaults so close together. And recall, Megan, he had committed a burglary prior to breaking into Jennifer's place. He was like on a spree here. Sounds like a spree, yeah. Yeah. 
The detective on the case who was interviewing Jennifer at the time had asked if she received a penicillin shot and the morning after a pill. Two customary procedures during uh, in these types of cases. And she had told him that she had not. And then they realized, well, they did not fully complete the rape kit. So Jennifer had to be taken to another hospital to have a second rape kit performed all over again. Oh, and she describes this as just being awful. This is the re-victimization. And Megan, at that time, we're talking the 80s. They didn't have nurses and doctors who were trained to deal with sexual assault victims. And you know, she recounts not being treated as sensitive as she was hoping to be treated. Now, Jennifer was determined to find her attacker. She went to the police department. They put together a composite sketch of what the man looked like. And, you know, Megan, when they do a composite sketch, she spent hours looking at eyebrows and eyes and noses and cheekbones and finally put together this composite sketch from what she remembered. Shortly after that, the police called Jennifer, telling them that they had a possible suspect and they asked her to come on in and view a photo lineup. Jennifer remembers it being difficult to choose between the six men. She was told that these men fit the description that she had given to them, and she was told to look at them carefully. And she distinctly remembered the detective saying... The perpetrator may or may not be here. Okay. Now that's impressive, Megan. Do you know why that's impressive? I mean, is it because they, that was before they reformed eyewitness procedures yes. and they used to be more influential in letting them know your perpetrator is here or, you know, may or may not implies that it's possible that there's no one in the lineup that yep. fits. Yeah. And as you mentioned, this is not leading and historically... Detectives would lead and it would almost force witnesses into choosing because they believe that that person who harmed them is there. So most police departments at the time did not use what is known as cautionary instructions or unbiased lineup instructions. It wasn't really until 1999 when the Department of Justice released. It was like a comprehensive guide for law enforcement on procedures that can help them obtain more accurate eyewitness evidence. And these types of instructions were included. Now, today, most jurisdictions have adopted it. Jennifer was able to discount a few of the men automatically, but she says when she looked at Ronald Cotton's photo, the fear came flooding back and that made her feel confident that this was the perpetrator. Now, a few days later, she was brought back in to do a physical lineup. She was informed that, that this was not going to be a typical lineup where you have suspects behind a one-way mirror so they wouldn't be able to see the victim. They actually brought this victim to a room with nothing separating her from these men except for a table. Why? From what I understand, they were in the middle of doing construction on the police facility. And because of that, they didn't have the capabilities to do this one-way mirror. Jennifer describes this as being the most frightening. Can you imagine? Not only is it frightening, not only does it, I feel like, victimize her so much so, but it also, I would think, would produce inaccurate results. Exactly. This is setting us up for lots of issues with this eyewitness identification pr procedure. As I mentioned, Jennifer says this scared her. She started shaking. Her, her head and her heart were pounding. She felt like she was going to throw up. The men were also instructed, of course, turn left, turn right. They had to do a voice presentation where they had to repeat some of the lines that Jennifer heard that night, such as shut up or I'll cut you. And Jennifer had remembered that her rapist had quite a distinct voice. So she felt that this was, she had told the detectives, you know, I think if I hear them speak, I'll be able to better figure something out here. Ultimately, when it came down to choosing, Jennifer said that Ronald Cotton's, quote, distinct nose and his, quote, almost smug and arrogant attitude is what helped her ultimately decide that it was him who had raped her that night. I want to stop to discuss a few of the procedures that were used to make this identification because eyewitness memory can become unreliable as a result of influences introduced by the legal system. And we see a lot of issues here. First of all, let's talk about the fact that Jennifer first viewed a photo lineup and then viewed a live lineup. Now, Ronald was in the photo lineup and then Ronald was in the live lineup. So that means you, isn't that like a confirmation bias or something like Close. that? Close. Unconscious transference. Ah, uh, okay. So unconscious transference refers to an eyewitness misidentification of an innocent bystander because of the witness's exposure to that person in another context. And it wasn't just any context. It was a mugshot. So this is very relevant because Jennifer sees Ronald's photo during the mugshot. So he then seems like the only familiar face to her. From what I understand, he was the only one that showed up in both the photo and the live lineup. Oh, well, there you go. Setting it up for failure already. Absolutely. And then the lineup array. There's a little bit mixed evidence on this, but historically speaking, research has consistently shown that lineup type matters. So we can show lineup sequentially or simultaneously. 
sequentially as one at a time. This is picture one. Is this the person? Yes or no before you move forward. This is different than simultaneous, which is seeing all, say, six people or six photos at once. When people see a simultaneous lineup, they're using what's called relative judgment. Which picture looks the most like, the, you know, person two looks like him, but three looks a little more like him. Oh, before you're comparing each picture to each other, you're not using what's called absolute judgment by comparing each photo or person to your memory. So they use the simultaneous array for both the photo lineup and also the live lineup. That's how it was done then pretty much. I know sequential wasn't really um, adopted or introduced until much later here. What I find interesting is research is now saying that sometimes it's actually better to use a simultaneous because of position effects and because of cases when someone has a distinct feature. So we're kind of, you see this a lot in research. It, you say one thing and now newer research is kind of questioning the older research, but when you have a sequential lineup, you're showing one picture at a time. So some research says the position of the suspect or the potential perpetrator could lead people. For example, if the person is in position one of a sequential versus position three versus position six, that's going to lead people to make less accurate identifications. I see. They're giving weight to someone who comes up first versus the middle. Okay, got it. Either way, I think there's more of a consensus that sequential is still the way to go. Then there's the weapon focus effect. Oh, I know this one. You've heard of this one before? Yes. So this is when a witness, and even more so happens when it's a victim, to a crime diverting their attention to a weapon rather than who is holding the weapon. This could be because we have heightened stress responses and our memory doesn't work as well in these situations. You're focusing more on an item that is novel. So someone who doesn't have a lot of experience with a weapon, this is going to affect them more because they're focusing on the weapon more. We know in Jennifer's case, there was a knife. So this is something that we have to take into consideration. Although like other witnesses, Jennifer had the opportunity to see her perpetrator for a longer period of time. But remember, he was not in the direct light and he would not turn to her when there were lights on. Got it. Then we have the cross race effect. Jennifer is a white woman. Her attacker was a black man. So Megan, what is the cross race effect? We make poor eyewitnesses when we have to identify people of other races. We're better at identifying people intra-race within our own, no, no matter what the race is. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And almost half of wrongful convictions that are based on misidentifications are cross-racial. And a majority of them are white victims and African-American perpetrators. Got it. And this is not intentional. And this is not related to someone's level of racism or bias because researchers have looked at that to see if the cross-race effect is stronger for people who hold racial views. And it's not. So it's not something that we can say a victim or a witness is doing on any conscious level. Yep. So this is really the perfect storm of eyewitness issues, right? We have the unconscious transference. We have the lineup array being simultaneous, not sequential. We have cross-race. We have weapon focus. This is not looking great. So on August 1st, 1984, just days after the attack, Ronald Cotton is arrested. The strongest evidence, of course, was Jennifer's identification of Ronald, but the police say that he seemed nervous. He got his dates mixed up, so he's, his alibis didn't end up checking out. And it wasn't because he was lying, it's because he mixed up his dates. So the night of the attack, he was home with his family, but he mistakenly thought it was a different night, and he said he was at a party. So gave the police a list of alibi witnesses, and all of those alibi witnesses said, no, that didn't happen. And then it turns out he was just really nervous and shook up. At the time, he was dating a white woman, and he says this angered police, and he was Someone who was on the police's radar, let's say. Did he have a criminal history of any type? He did. He had a record of mostly low-level offenses. However, he did serve 18 months in prison for an attempted sexual assault. Well, that's going to hurt, too. That's going to hurt. And he says that, along with the fact that it was a small town and he's always dated white women, that the police were racist and they always had an eye out for him. I mean, that certainly can be true, but it can also be true that because he had an attempted sexual assault and because he was identified. Of course. So you can't, you cannot blame the police for that. Uh, no, not that, that part. Not at all, no. no. Well, administering a shitty lineup, maybe. Yes, but, yes. Yeah. But if the police are looking for someone and someone has a history of these types of crimes and someone identifies them, I don't blame the police that they, you know, were looking at Ronald. That sexual assault, that attempted sexual assault, Ronald explains it by saying it was actually his ex-girlfriend 
and she was a white woman and her parents were very angry when they found out that Ronald was dating her and that they were the ones who pushed forward for these charges. I don't know, this is not corroborated, but Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that in. So Ronald was 22 years old at this time. He was the same age as Jennifer and living in the same area as her. The two did not know each other. He was unemployed at the time, but he had worked at a local restaurant in the area. Okay. The trial begins in January of 1985. Jennifer testified for two days and she physically pointed out Ronald as her attacker. And we know that is extremely powerful to juries. She was very, very confident at this time. Another issue, confidence contamination. This happens after an identification when a witness gets positive feedback or it's called post-identification feedback. Now, this could be nonverbal or even unconscious, but it's when a detective or a lineup administer increases the confidence of an eyewitness by saying, good job, right? You, you got him. Now, over time, people's confidence for identifications increases, but accuracy actually decreases. Right. So your confidence actually gets stronger the more you are asked to recall a memory. So at this point, Jennifer's told the story several times. She, of course, she's testifying She's spoken to lawyers and police about this. So the more she's telling the story, the more confident she's getting in what happened. Mm -hmm. But at this point, according to research, her accuracy is not necessarily correlating with her confidence. That's very interesting. After two weeks and just four hours of deliberation, a jury found Ronald Cotton guilty of one count of rape and one count of burglary. He was sentenced to life in prison and what Jennifer says was the happiest day of her life. The overwhelming evidence rested on the identification by Jennifer, the in-court identification and the testimony by Jennifer. Other evidence included a flashlight that they found in Cotton's home that they said resembled the one that was used by the assailant. They also found rubber that they said was a piece of rubber in Jennifer's home that was consistent with rubber that they found on one of Cotton's shoes. That sounds like junk to me. In prison, Ronald kept to himself. He wrote lots of letters proclaiming his innocence to news outlets, lawyers, organizations, anyone that would listen to him. His family fully supported him and believed in his innocence because after all, Megan, they were home with him the night of the crime. Ronald's mother, Ronald's mother's boyfriend, Ronald's sister. So they all knew that he could not have done this. And I'm assuming they were all alibi witnesses, but there is family. And so, you know, I I know the way this one goes too. Yep. So whenever you have an alibi witness that is a loved one, that's It's not going to be as strong as other alibi witnesses. Right. One day, about a year after Cotton was convicted, another man joined him working in the prison kitchen. This man's name was Bobby Poole. Okay. Ronald's first impression was Bobby was, hey, that guy looks a lot like me. Okay, I definitely know where we're going now. And people in prison got them confused. And I urge you all to look up pictures of these two men. Because at first, when I looked up the pictures, I said, these guys look nothing alike to me. I really didn't see it. And that's why I want you to look it up too. But if you cover, if you look at just the eyes, they're just the eyebrows like up, they do look similar. If you cover the nose, you look down, they look similar. They just have very different noses. So I want you all to take a look at that. Ronald, you know, asked him where he was from. And he said he's from that same area that Ronald was from. And Ronald said, you know, you look awfully like the composite sketch in my case. Are you the one who committed the crimes in which I am serving the time for? He actually confronted him and said this. And Bobby says, no, man, that's not me. Ronald hated this guy. And Ronald had a strong feeling that this is what was going on. Because after all, Ronald knew he was innocent, right? So why was Bobby Poole in prison? Sexual assault. Yep. Bobby Poole was serving consecutive life sentences for a series of brutal rapes. And now rumors start circulating that Poole starts bragging to other inmates that Cotton was doing some of his time. And this really pisses Cotton off because he's innocent. And in his book, which we'll talk about later, he describes how he fashioned a blade out of a piece of metal and he planned on killing Bobby Poole. His father is the one who talked him out of it, begging him not to. He said, put your faith in God. And if you kill Bobby Poole, then you really do belong behind those bars and you are no longer an innocent man. Well, I would think if you kill him too, you might not be able to prove that you're he's the one who committed the crimes. You kind of need him alive for that. Yes. And as much as he hated Bobby Poole, he, you know, he did take what his father said and he decided, I think he says he ended up like flushing the blade down the toilet. He decided, you know, I'm not going to do this. But what he did do is he started taking notes, everything he could about Bobby and why he was suspicious of him. To me, this is the best part. He even got a photo with Bobby. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> so okay. in prison, remember I mentioned Ronald had sisters. 
Yes. Bobby was interested in one of Ronald's sisters and said, hey, uh, can I get your sister's number, like to date her? And Ronald said, sure, let's take a picture first so I could see if she's interested. Very clever. How clever is that? So he, you could see the picture online, too. There's a picture of the two men in prison. Ronald, under the guise of sending this to his sister, takes a picture with this man. If you recall, Megan, remember that other woman who had been raped just an hour after Thompson? Remember, they were in the hospital together. Now, this was the same neighborhood, the same kind of attack, and the police were pretty much certain it was the same man. They had almost the exact description of what this man was wearing and what he looked like. An appeals court ruled that the evidence relating to this victim should have been allowed in the first trial. So remember, I didn't mention that victim in the first trial because she didn't pick Ronald from a lineup. So they decided not to include her case when they were trying Ronald the first time around. And the jury was never told about the the fact that there was another victim who did not identify him. Correct. So luckily, the appeals court believed that he needed a new trial. So that's exactly what they did. They granted Ronald Cotton a new trial. And at this trial, the witnesses would get to see Bobby Poole, who was subpoenaed by Cotton's lawyer. He had an amazing legal team. And also hear from two other inmates who said that Poole told them, you remember how Poole was bragging that Cotton's serving time for him? Those two men were also allowed to come testify. Cotton thought this was, you know, this was going to be the ticket to his freedom. Unfortunately, Poole, of course, denied this. These two witnesses were... They're jailhouse snitches, not, you know, prison, Mm -hmm. but they're not considered the most reliable, unfortunately. Exactly. And it was hearsay. And the worst part was that Thompson testified, and so did this other victim. Both of them testified. No, nope, we've never seen that man pointing at Bobby Poole, and that is our attacker pointing at Ronald Cotton. So the first victim who didn't pick Cotton out is now picking him out. Is now, or is picking, now saying that? Yeah, it's because him. he's already been convicted in the first trial. So this goes back to that confidence contamination. Mm-hmm. This woman who never ever picked him is now standing in court in front of a jury pointing at him. So now you have two victims who are IDing Ronald. So what do you think happens? He's convicted again. He's convicted, but now he's convicted to a life term plus 54. Right, because now he's got two crimes on him. So unfortunately, Ronald Cotton heads back to prison. Nine years later, Cotton was watching a very famous trial in October of 1995. O.J. Simpson? O.J. Simpson trial. What do you think he learns about watching this trial? DNA. DNA, right? This was one of the first times we saw DNA being used in criminal trials. This is, you know, the mid-1990s. DNA had already arrived on the scene, but it was still making its way into, you know, the courtrooms. And so he's probably thinking Jennifer had a rape kit, and so there'd be a DNA and the other victim. So he's thinking, this is going to prove my innocence. I need to get this DNA tested. Now, at this time, Ronald had been in prison for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Jennifer had gone ahead and gotten married. She had triplets. Oh, my God. I know. And she was moving on with her life. And she said she, of course, she never moved on. But, you know, life was moving forward for her. She had these three toddlers at home. She gets a phone call from the lead detective that says Ronald Cotton is claiming he is innocent and we need to go back and check the DNA. Now, why were they calling Jennifer? Well, we know that they have to call a victim to let them know these things are happening. But they needed Jennifer to give blood because it turns out the old evidence, it was hard for them to isolate the DNA profiles if, they, if she had given a new vial of blood, that would help them be able to... Extract it? Yes. That would help them be able to extract out the perpetrator's blood more easily. Okay, got it. The DNA test was run pretty quickly, which we know does not happen now. That's shocking. Yes. And Jennifer was very quickly informed that they were wrong. The DNA did not belong to Ronald. Who do you think it belonged to? Bobby Poole. Bobby Poole. This was the first DNA test on record that had exonerated a prisoner while positively incriminating another person. Wow, really? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. It's like two for one. Isn't that fabulous? In 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 a wonderful way. It really is incredible. Subsequently, Poole did confess to both the attack on Jennifer and the other victim from that evening. Wow. In July of that year, Ronald Cotton was officially cleared of all charges and released from prison. Cotton ended up serving almost 11 years in prison. Just the next month, the governor of North Carolina officially pardoned him, and he got an official apology from the district attorney's office. They really handled this the way that all places should handle these wrongful convictions. Did he receive compensation as well? We'll get to that very shortly. Okay. Soon after his release, he got a job in the warehouse of LabCorp. Ironically, this is the same company that tested the DNA evidence that proved his innocence. I was going to ask you that. I had a feeling. I just got the chills. Isn't that great? He got married, he had a child, and he bought a piece of land to live on. So 
things are things are going okay for him. Now Jennifer starts to feel like she failed everyone. And she was getting death threats. She was getting hate mail. People were really blaming her for this. She struggled. She said she struggled to function normally. She had the guilt, of course, of sending this innocent man to prison. And she was trying to figure out how she could go about repairing this damage that she had done. But at the same time, she was still seeing Ronald's face in her nightmares. Like It's almost like she couldn't accept this because for 10 years, that was the face of her attacker. Oh, yeah, you can't change that immediately. It's hard for your brain to reconcile that, that mm-hmm. information. Absolutely. She wrote an op-ed for the New York Times. She said, quote, Ronald Cotton and I are the same age, so I knew what he had missed during those years. My life had gone on. I had gotten married. I had graduated from college. I worked. I was a parent. Ronald Cotton hadn't gotten to do any of that. So she was feeling severe guilt about this. Can you imagine? I mean, clearly this was Bobby Poole's fault. Bobby Poole did this to Jennifer and Bobby Poole did this to Ronald, but the public sentiment surrounding it wasn't really placing the blame on Bobby. I mean, he created these victims, a victim first out of her, a victim out of Ronald Cotton. And, you know, we can see it now. Remember, Bobby Poole eventually made his way to prison about a year later. But in between the time of Jennifer's rape and the time where Bobby Poole ended up in prison for other crimes. They were talking like two dozen other victims. So while you have this man who was wrongfully convicted, you have someone outside brutalizing the community, not only getting away with what he has done, but hurting additional people. A career criminal who just was going to keep victimizing. Absolutely. In February of 1997, there was a frontline interview titled What Jennifer Saw. And Jennifer was interviewed for this. And she was asked what she noticed about Ronald Cotton's actions in the courtroom. And what was it about him that made her think that this was the man who harmed her? And she says, quote, I think that if I was on trial for a crime that I did not commit and I knew I didn't commit it, I would have done everything in my power to bring forth evidence to prove I didn't commit it. I would want to convey to the jury that I am an innocent person. I would fall to my knees. I would cry. I would do anything I could possibly do. But his composure was very unusual. The reason I'm bringing this up is I find this very interesting. I think people have this illusion of innocent people or of what they would do in this situation. And what they would do is scream, you know, yell, cry, do everything they can. But we don't see that when people are wrongfully convicted. What do you think that's all about? Oh, we also, we've talked about this before. They're advised by their attorneys to keep their composure. Yeah, exactly. And then they keep their composure and people say they didn't look remorseful enough. Um, and if they do cry, people say, well, they're obviously faking it. They're trying to get attention. Yeah. They're almost damned anyway. But usually I think it's the attorney to advise them how to act in, in the court. You're absolutely right. And that's exactly what happened here is Ronald Cotton's attorneys had told him to act like that. He says he was dying inside during this. They probably didn't want him to act guilty. Yes. And Jennifer says that when Ronald Cotton walked out of the courtroom after being sentenced to life, she said he's got to be the guiltiest person in the world. He just doesn't seem like he cares. Because he was probably in such shock and denial at that point, he probably had no way of even processing what was going on. Absolutely. Ronald was also interviewed for this front line, but the two did not cross paths. However, it would be this interview that would lead them to eventually meet. Jennifer had decided that she wanted to meet Ronald because after she watched his interview on PBS Frontline, he said things that really resonated with her. And she said, I need to make this right. So she reached out to the lead detective and arranged to meet him at a nearby church. So Ronald and his wife and Jennifer and her husband, and you had like a victim advocate and the detective, they all got together. And she said she wanted to just speak to Ronald and his wife separately. And she said when he came into the room, she said, quote, I'm sorry if I spend every day for the rest of my life telling you how sorry I am. It would not come close to how I feel. Oh. Chills. Yeah, me too. And Jennifer was baffled at his response. And I think most people would be because you know what he says? Jennifer, I forgive you. I am not angry at you. I do not want you to be frightened of me. I will never hurt you. I want you to be happy and I want you to have a good life. Wow. Good person. Right? Talk about like redemption. And it's uh, chills again. Now, the two talk for about two hours. They talk about their pain of being victims of a flawed system and about how they're both victims of Bobby Poole. And they continued to spend time with each other, and they became the closest of friends. This is like real restoration, you know? Yes, and that, that's actually a very nice segue to what Jennifer's doing now, which we'll get to in one moment. Now, Jennifer and Ronald, they're not just friends. They travel around the country telling their story. I actually heard them speak together at a conference, and there's not a, there was not a dry eye in the room. They're both just the strongest, most amazing people. Jennifer says that Ronald has taught her about forgiveness, healing and faith, and he has taught her to not feel like a victim anymore. 
but she's helped him in many ways too. She lobbied to help change law so that Cotton would be entitled to more than the $5,000 the state originally offered as compensation. $5,000 for 11 well, years? 5000 per year with a cap, which still isn't enough. Not even close. She ended up writing letters to legislators. She gave endless interviews, and, and eventually Cotton got a settlement of nearly $110,000. Jennifer ended up becoming an outspoken opponent of the death penalty as well because she talked about the unreliability of eyewitness testimony. And it was not just Ronald she advocated for. She actually went to Texas to demonstrate against the controversial execution of Gary Graham. Do you know about that case? I don't remember him, no. Okay, so basically Gary Graham, um, he was on death row, but his sentence was based largely on the testimony of only one eyewitness who was confident that Graham was the one who murdered someone when she only saw him from 30 to 40 feet away. Oh, God. And that's only a f and it was only for a fraction of the time that Jennifer saw her attacker. And Jennifer was wrong. And she saw her attacker for longer and closer. So she felt that it was up to her to go advocate for this controversial execution. Unfortunately, the jury convicted him and they never heard any testimony against this identification. And he was executed in 2000 and many believe wrongfully so. If you go to the Death Penalty Information Center, they talk about people that have been executed, that they have strong reason to believe in innocence. And he is right up there. Oh. In 2009, the two published one of my favorite books called Picking Cotton, Our Memoir of Injustice and Redemption. That's some name. That name is so significant in so many ways. It is. They're co-authors on this, and it tells their story from both of their perspectives, which I love. And it also highlights the flawed criminal justice system. The book is set to be made into a movie. Oh, I can't yes, wait. It just got picked up in 2019, and it's going to be directed by Jessica Sanders, who directed After Innocence, one of my favorite Oh. documentaries that I show all of my wrongful conviction students. Now, this book, Megan, you need to read it. Oh, of course I do. I've read it twice and I'll probably read it again. And I have my students often read it when I teach wrongful convictions. Now, what is Jennifer doing? Well, what is Jennifer not doing? So Jennifer Thompson is one of the most inspirational human beings I have ever had the pleasure to meet. She is the founder of the Healing Justice Project which was founded in 2015, and it's dedicated solely to helping those who are affected by wrongful convictions. Now, we're not just talking about the individual who is exonerated for a crime. It's the original victim. It's the original victim's family. It's the wrongfully convicted person's family. It could be the police department. It could be the jurors. It could be anyone who's participated in the system that has failed and who are carrying the weight of a wrongful conviction. Right. So the organization's core mission is to really just acknowledge all these layers of harm and all the people that are affected. And Thompson says, quote, at the center of every wrongful conviction case, there's a perpetrator and everyone in the circle outside gets hurt. So Healing Justice, they do so much amazing work. They have retreats and now they do virtual circles that utilize restorative justice practices. What is restorative justice, Megan? Do you know? It's taking both an offender and a victim and bringing them together in a way that they can be, uh, they can have a healing experience. And it's meant to restore the victim. You know, punishment doesn't accomplish that goal in the way that meeting someone face to face and speaking to them and hearing from them directly might. And I think the title, I think the name of the organization, Healing Justice, really does explain what they do. They do peer support, they do art therapy, just different types of trauma recovery activities that help enable, you know, this collective healing. They also provide individualized support services and resources. They conduct public education events and professional trainings that help offer solutions to some of these, I guess we could say some of these policies that might contribute to wrongful convictions. Lastly, they host listening sessions that are aimed at motivating systemic change where the listeners are actually justice officials and policymakers. And these individuals sit down and hear about the harm that has been caused and they learn about the needed reforms to help the harm. And they're hearing it from those with lived experience. This work's incredible. It sounds like the two of them are a powerhouse in this field. They are. And I mean, it shouldn't have happened, but because it happened... They've been able to push forward, I bet, reforms that never would have been pushed had something not been highlighted in this regard. Healing Justice also runs a website called SurvivorServices.org, which offers post-conviction survivor resources. This is where they have information and tools that help improve post-conviction services and support for both crime victims and survivors. How can our listeners help? Support Healing Justice. You can go to their website and you can make a contribution and learn more. Everyone go to healingjusticeproject.org 
and click on support. We need to support organizations like this that are doing this type of amazing, incredible work that is recognizing the holistic harms that are done when an individual is wrongfully convicted. Because again, we talk about wrongful convictions often and ignore the original crime victim and all of the other individuals who have been harmed. Because it's not just one, it's a wrongful conviction, but it's not, it doesn't impact one person. The impact can be felt by an entire community. It's like a ripple effect. Absolutely. There are so many areas in which we need reform. I witness, you know, identification. I think we're seeing some reforms. We have a long way to go. In this case, sadly, this man served 11 years of his life. But glad to see that the system at least did work and that he was exonerated and he was made whole again. And then he took that experience and he made helped make her whole again. I mean, the whole story is inspirational and encouraging. I was surprised at his original sentence. I'm not that familiar with the law in North Carolina, but I have rarely heard of a rape sexual assault case where you get life in prison. And I'm wondering if there wasn't any racial bias in the sentencing. So that possibly concerns me, which is not to say I advocate for, you know, for not having strong punishments. It just sounded, from what I know in other states, disproportionate. And remember, he didn't have this lengthy history of violent crime. He had one offense, which was an attempted sexual assault. But for a life sentence, you would expect him have been to have been a chronic violent offender. Right. I would have expected habitual offender, three strikes and you're out, something mm-hmm. like that. So um, I'm just so glad that, that they were actually able to prove that he was innocent. And the work they're doing is incredible. Um, I haven't heard the story in full. So thank you, Amy. I thought it was fantastic and inspiring. And thanks for telling us all what we can do to help out. I also think it highlights the issue of we should not sentence people to life based on eyewitness testimony without corroborating evidence. Absolutely. Megan, before we leave today, we have a question from one of our patrons, Megan M. So Megan has two questions, and I love these because one of them is lighthearted and one of them is a little more serious. Okay. So which one do you want to do first? Lighthearted. All right. Does pineapple belong on pizza? No. No? No, never, never, well, never. what belongs on pizza? Anything but pineapple. Where does pineapple Actually, what, belong? I, I just don't like pineapple in general, oh, so well, I don't like different. it on pizza. Okay. But I for my pizza, pepperoni is fine. I even like broccoli on pizza, which I know is weird. But mm. pineapple is a no for me. How about you? I think pineapple is okay if it is accompanied by ham. Yeah, well, that's usually how it comes, right? No, some people have just pineapple. Oh, so okay. I like the salty-sweet combination. Oh. I personally do not ever order pineapple. Pineapple on pizza, but I respect it. (laughs) (laughs) You respect it. Okay. Yes. All right. The next question. That's a fun question, by the way. Thank you, Megan. I know. I really like that. The next question is geared more towards true crime and criminal justice. I grew up in a cop family, so interest in wrongful convictions and potential miscarriages of justice is not so well received. And I thank you for giving me a place to feel at home. Amazing. I'm wondering if you ladies have had similar resistance from your families in the work that you did on direct appeal. Not on direct appeal, no. Um, but I will say in the past, I did have I, some family members who were not as generally supportive of my position of uh, criminal justice reform and the system. I have an individual in my immediate family who whose political views differ a lot from mine. Okay. So when I do work in prison or if I spend time advocating for somebody that this person doesn't think deserves it, yeah, I hear about it a little bit, but, you know, I just take it in stride. It's I think yeah. so, too. I mean, yeah. I've had friends. Uh, in general, people were pretty supportive. My mom was, like, super excited about direct appeal. So, yeah. yeah. In general, I think we're lucky that we've been more supported. I actually think that the more people in my life that I have that are kind of questioning what we do or how we do it, that's better. Because those are the people whose minds I want to change. Yeah. Agreed. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great questions. All right, Megan. Thank you so much. And again, please go and support the Healing Justice Project at healingjusticeproject.org. And thank you all for listening. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer and editor is James Varga. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show while gaining access to ad-free episodes, exclusive AMAs, and other bonus content for a small monthly contribution through Patreon. For more information, visit patreon.com slash women in crime.
Sources for today's episode include Frontline PBS, Death Penalty Information Center, The Innocence Project, Picking Cotton, The New York Times, The Healing Justice Project, The Associated Press, and Survivor Services, and Survivor Services, and Survivor Services, and Survivor Services.